Hi, this is Andrew, and this is Keynote, the daily now.tv chat show with some of the world's leading thinkers and writers. Hello, everybody. It is Monday, September the 11th, 2023. September 11th, of course, being a symbolic day in the United States, uh, a day where many people indeed continue to think about death. Uh, it's the question that preoccupies humans, perhaps distinguishes us from other species. What happens when we die? Where do we go? Do we go anywhere? It's a question that has perhaps shaped and continues to shape human history in terms of religion and how we think about ourselves, in terms of what psychologists call existential questions. And it's a question we're going to address today with my guest, uh, Alexander uh, Battiani. He's a very distinguished professor in Europe of uh, uh, psychology uh, and uh, existential um, therapy. And he's the author of a really interesting new book called Threshold, Terminal Lucidity and the Border of Life and Death. He is joining us, perhaps appropriately enough, from Vienna today. The book is out um, next uh, this week. Alexander, congratulations on the new book. Uh, tell me a little bit about what you do. Are you a scientist? Are you a, a psychologist? Are you a therapist? Or are you some way, in some way or other a combination of all these things? Well, first, thanks for having me, Andrew. Um, I am, I think, mainly a scientist and I'm doing, I teach psychotherapy, a, a special type of psychotherapy, existential psychotherapy, uh, one which was founded by Viktor Frankl, who's, the, I think, world famous author of Man's Search for Meaning, Holocaust Survivor, and this book is basically a Holocaust testimony. But much more than that, he, he, even before he, he went to the camps. He was a, a disciple of Sigmund Freud at a very young age of Alfred Adler, and then went on to build up his own school of psychotherapy. And I'm here in Vienna. At, I'm working here at the Viktor Frankl Institute. I'm also in Budapest, where we've got a research center on, I think, existential questions in psychology, which basically means on mankind there. Yeah. And, it always borders also on philosophy because, as you mentioned, the questions we are addressing when it comes to death and dying, I mean, there's not one specialty. I mean, medicine is involved, neurology is involved, psychology, sociology, philosophy, theology, of course, also. So everyone is affected by this topic. So therefore, there's not one single discipline. It's a, it's a huge endeavor to even come close to these questions. Yeah. So I'm mainly... A, I think I'm mainly a scientist. I do a teacher's university. I've got a few professorships, and that's basically what I'm doing. Another word to describe what you're doing, and this is very much involved with Victor Thra Frankl, mm -hmm. is uh, you're a, 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 a logo therapist. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that a, a, um, a correct word to describe what you're doing, this field of logo therapy? Yeah, I mean, the the... The term logotherapy refers to the third Viennese school of psychotherapy. So it was Adler, where there was Sigmund Freud, psychoanalysis, Alfred Adler, and Viktor Frankl. And it's called logotherapy because uh, logos in this, in this context refers to meaning and, um, let's say, moving one step beyond mere psychology and yet being within the field of psychology. It's an evidence-based school of psychotherapy which has worldwide centers. I'm here at the Institute and our Institute, Victor Frankl Institute, has affiliation, affiliated centers, about 150, and it's almost all over the world. I mean, minus a few countries, like maybe I think China is currently in North Korea, but otherwise we are really on every continent, uh, trying our best to help people. And one specialty of this is to address human suffering, which in itself does not signify a mental illness. Other, in other words, when, I mean, there are, there are moments in our lives, such as guilt, pain, mortality, our mortality, and the mortality of other people, which, we, which can hit us hard. And 
in which people need support. To put it mildly, Alexander. <laughs> yeah. uh, and in which people do need support, a helping hand, somebody who is there, who is listening, who may be offering a few ideas on how to cope with, with our mortality or what can be even worse, the mortality of other people we love. Um, or the fact that nothing is, you know, everything is, time is moving on and, and things lose their nature, lose their form. Yeah. And to, and we try to help people. And it's very successful work. I mean, Viktor Frankl was a colleague of Kübler Ross, who I think many people will know, who basically was the founding mother of, of the field of psychiatry and psychology of death and dying. And, yeah, so I think he was very much a pioneer in this, of course. So, let, so let's get to the book, uh, yeah. Alexander, because um, it's, it's, it's a fascinating project, very ambitious. Threshold, terminal lucidity and the border of life and death. It's about this, this border, this journey, maybe a journey we're finishing or starting or simultaneously ending and beginning. Mm -hmm. Tell me about what you're trying to do in this book. Well, I mean, the book is uh, basically on a phenomenon. The subtitle, the first subtitle, Tonal Lucidity, refers to a phenomenon which has been known since time immemorial and doctors of all kinds, I mean, old Greece and India and Persia described it, but it's only recently come on the map of the scientific landscape, if you want. Yeah. And that refers to the fact that quite a number of people who do have dementia or other brain disorders and have, have been severely cognitively impaired, I mean, severely cognitively impaired, yeah. didn't talk, didn't recognize their relatives and so on. Suddenly, and it's unexpected and spontaneous and there's no way of predicting it, suddenly make a comeback. And in other words, they are there once again, they are back. Yeah. And then and they die. <laughs> yeah, well, first of all, they're, let's say, yes, and they, yes, and it's terminal, they die, yeah? but perhaps even more important, it's, um, they talk with their relatives, they, they relish and old memories come up, um, they seek peace, you know, when there's conflicts to be resolved and so on, and very often, I mean, most, of, not most, but a, a sizable number of them seem to be aware of the fact that this is not going on for long and that they're going to die soon. And that's precisely what's happening in the very vast majority of cases, as far as we know. I should, I should mention the book is based not only on the fact that such a phenomenon stares you in the face and needs to be addressed because it's so important, and it's also very moving for the, for the witnesses who, who, who look at this, yeah. but it's also important because it might tell us I mean, when people are close to death, very often, with or without um, dementia or lucidity, they are often key witnesses when it comes to what it means to be alive. And I know that sounds paradox, but if you listen, if you don't go away, if you if you are there, if, if you are ready not to talk but to listen to, to what people have to say in the last weeks, days, hours perhaps, yeah, it must be something because when we are close to death and we are at least somewhat lucid, there's no social pressure. Nobody expects anyone, hopefully, anyone from someone who's dying. So you, you encounter, um, in a sense, you encounter a pure being in the sense of there's no impression management. It's not how do I look like. Nobody expects anything. And even if maybe you couldn't care less, yeah, because... But, <laughs> you know, I take your point on that, Alexander, but... <laughs> What about the internal pressure? We, we know, and you know, I use that word carefully. No, uh, we 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 we're aware that we're in the last moments of our life, mm -hmm. and we often, as the old cliche, uh, when you're on your deathbed, what do you think about? So, isn't that one explanation? Is for a moment people's lives uh, appear before them, and and they wonder and question and, and, and think what, what were the, what was all this for? Uh, yeah. And that's so, so it's point. an internal pressure rather than a social one. Yeah, but I wouldn't call it a pressure. Maybe it's, it's a, mo it's a time of insight and, and for, and since the 1970s, when, you know, there was a certain reform movement in psychiatry, even in medicine, uh, to don't see death only as a defeat, but 
as a very genuine part of being alive because being born means destined to die, you know. And what one observes and what many studies and, and, and nurses and so on tell us is that these questions you were mentioning usually come up in the last, let's say, weeks or months or so, yeah. And for many people much earlier also, yeah. I mean, that's why there's philosophy or at least a large proportion of it is dedicated to this question. How should I live given the fact that I do know that I won't be here forever? So therefore, what I do know now has a certain weight. Yeah, it's not that I have time, eternal time to undo things I did wrong or to repair damages I did and so on. So given that life, you know, that life is finite, that we do have an end, it gives us a lot of, I wouldn't say pressure, but responsibility because we can't play and fool around for soon, for, forever. Yeah, It's not that we are... Um, in a testing phase of life, the film already started. Yeah, it's it's live broad, broadcast if you want. Yeah, and um, and that strikes people very often at the end. But once again, during more often during the last days or weeks, rather than or when they receive a diagnosis, rather than the very last moments or hours. Yeah, and what we observe, and this is important to know. Yeah that when we, when we move to the last hours or so, things happen which are a bit unexpected. Why are they unexpected? Because at least in our current secular culture, we are trying to look away, even repress or you know, outsource death and dying. And I think one of the messages of this book and what I'm trying to convey also to my students or to anyone who I talk about this topic is that no, don't look away, because if you keep it in darkness, we project all kinds of things on it. Yeah. Um, and usually it's not things which are, which are good things. Yeah. But if you start looking, and even more important, if you start listening, people will tell you very moving stories. And if you go to a hospice, and, or if you talk to hospice nurses, or if you go to a scientific congress on death and dying, and people who really are there yeah, or dedicate their lives to this topic, yeah, you see that there's much more, I wouldn't say happiness, but a certain kind of, um, it's, a, it's a relaxed and natural way of connecting to life. Yeah? And this is very often what happens in the last hours. We are talking with Alexander Battiani, the author of a fascinating new book, uh, Threshold, Terminal Lucidity and the Border of Life and Death. I'm going to take a short break, thank our sponsor, Liberties Quarterly, uh, a journal of culture and, and politics. Uh, run a short ad for them, and then we'll be back with Alexander talking more about Threshold. So don't go away, anyone. Don't die in the next 30 <laughs> seconds. Beyond the news, the noise, there is nuance, insight. Liberties is not just a journal of ideas. It's a meteor of intelligent substance. It's the place to be for engaged citizens. Politics, opinion, substance. Liberties is a triumph for freedom of thought. A quarterly of urgency, of cultural exploration, of intellectual delight, of immaculate prose. It's invaluable. Subscribe now or find Liberties at your favorite bookseller. And you can find more at libertiesjournal.com. Fascinating uh, conversation we're having with my guest, uh, Alexander Battiani, the author of Threshold. So, Alexander, let's get to the book. Yeah. Um, you're, you're, you're investigating this border of life and death. What exactly did you do? Was this, did this come out of, of, of research? How did you put together the material for the book? I mean, in 2009, a few, I think, three articles appeared in scientific journals on the phenomenon of terminal lucidity. And when I read this, I thought we have to look at this because most of these uh, um, studies published in 2009 were about historical cases, about Victorian doctors who often wrote very elaborate case histories, much longer than they are today. They're almost like chronicles of somebody dying, beautiful to read, actually. And some of them reported this phenomenon. And uh, Michael Nahm, a biologist in Freiburg, and Bruce Grayson, a colleague of mine, psychiatrist in Virginia, professor, he, they published a paper on these old cases. And some of them were 
frankly too good to be true and I thought so we need to know does this happen today you know when diagnostics are much better and we do have certain instruments to look into what's happening in our brains and so on. so diagnostic is much more reliable and there's also uniform uh, systems of diagnostics when it comes to dementia for example yeah, or which, which type of dementia so and during th this happened in autumn at the end of the term and usually the students are already overburdened with what they have to learn for the for the exams so usually i use the last two to three sessions in my lecture to talk about findings which they don't have to learn given that they have so much to learn anyway but which might be interesting and not yet textbook material and when i talked and presented what i knew back then about terminal lucidity i a few of them said, okay, let's do something. And I, I look for volunteers. And that's how we started the first large-scale European study uh, on contemporary cases in terminal lucidity, or TL for short. Yeah. And so we sent out questionnaires to have a uniform way of reporting, like you know, age and some basic facts about the patient, um, cognitive state on a typical day before the lucid episode, but during the disease, yeah, and then measurement, how, how lucid were these people? Uh, did they talk and did it make sense and did they connect with their eyes? Was there responsive speech so you could ask them something? So we had a certain um, register on, uh, to, to, to capture as many data as possible. And we didn't know what to expect. We sent this out to about 600 hospices, hospitals, nursing homes, and so on. And then we waited. And we thought we'd wait quite a while. But in fact, the very next day, we received the first reports on terminal lucidity. And, and ever since, my database has been growing. And this, the book, in this book I talk, I present the basic findings of, uh, of my cases. 300 something cases at the moment but perhaps even let's say on a from a on an existential personal level with some of my respondents um, sent their questionnaires but also a personal letter and they said look the data are quickly reported this and that happens but i want to tell you what really happens so the type of conversations we had or we had one patient who, who was a poet and his wife also was, you know, writing poetry. And when he was dying, but having his lucid episode and not being able to speak for a year or so, which is very tragic if you're a writer to lose your language. And he quoted um, uh, love poems to his wife and they were the love poems they quoted to each other when they fell freshly in love. And he asked her, do you remember? Now, if you know what dementia does to our brain, if such a patient asked his wife, do you remember? Yeah, it means quite a lot, but it meant quite a lot anyway. And th there are many such stories, which I also quote in the book, because I think it, we owe it to those who are, who are reporting it and allowing it to be reprinted, of course, but we also owe it to those who are, you know, these are very key witnesses, um, on a topic which still lies very much in the dark, not because it is so dark, but because we leave it in the dark. Yeah. Well, as you and, say, don't look away, which may be the title of this conversation. Uh, <laughs> you got a nice review on Publishers Weekly, which suggests that um, your research, and I'm quoting them, right. I don't know whether you would agree with this conclusion, that Let's your see. research team is on its way to proving the existence of the quote-unquote soul is there any truth to that? I mean, did you uncover uh, I mean, that's, of the idea of the soul, Alexander? No, that, I mean, that's a very strong claim, which I, I'd never do and I don't do in making the book. But are you tentatively but, pointing that way in the research? But I, I should put it like this. Dementia or brain damage and, what's, and what brain damage does to our minds and to our cognition and to our personalities, yeah, would in principle be, be fairly strong evidence against the soul. Because if the soul is so easily affected that if you drink a bottle of wine, or, you know, a lot of whatever alcohol or take something else, or if you have a blow in the head, but that our mind is severely impacted. Yeah. Now, 
the other side of it is, um, well, and dementia very often is called, you know, the destroyer of the soul and the, there's a, the body is a grim reminder of, of what has once been or who has once been there. And if you then find that a severely disordered brain, because if you look at the picture of, of a brain, let's say, of with Alzheimer's, yeah, it's not, I mean, even the even the man on the street would see, would immediately say, no, whoever is this, this person must be cognitively severely impaired. And then what we find is that such a person with a very diseased brain functions almost or rather perfectly. Not only that is even wise enough to know that he or she is going to die very soon, which most of us do not know exactly when it happened. No? And often they say very wise things. So I, I should think what I present in my book is not overly compatible with materialism, which basically says that there's no soul. Every, you know, the fabric of us is matter and that's basically it, or brain tissue. And it's, I think it's much more con compatible with the idea of a soul. So in this sense, it points in this direction. But yeah, that's, that I would say. <laughs> You're talking to me from Vienna, the heart of uh, therapy land. Uh, you're an <laughs> existential therapist. You've taught all over Europe. Uh, you're associated with the Frankel Institute of Log Logotherapy and, of course, the great Victor Frankel. Um, I I'm curious, uh, did you find cultural differences here? Uh, one would expect this of Viennese poets and artists and therapists, but maybe not elsewhere. Or, or, or does culture not really matter in terms of your research? Was the terminal lucidity that you discovered, was it independent of culture? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, what happens in terminal lucidity? The or original person, if you want, the pre-morbid person reoccurs. And of course, if he or she reoccurs, it's the person with his or her biography, culture, and so on. So we have to differentiate between the phenomenon as such which is culture invariant. In other words, it happens everywhere and it seems to be happened at all times. Yeah. So if you look at the very, very early reports, let's say from ancient India or ancient Persia, uh, the phenomenon as such is exactly the same. The content of what people are saying, of course, they're saying it with their biography and they're, they're saying, you know, they talk in their language and that not only the words they use, but also the concepts they use. Speaking about concepts, but if you look at the very early reports, let's say even the Victorian doctors, but go back further in history to ancient India or whatever, then of course those who are reporting it, they weren't ashamed of saying, and then the soul was released from a very diseased body. So you have a soldier in one of the Persian wars who had a severe head injury and was didn't have dementia, but severe cognitive impairment after t after traumatic brain injury and makes a comeback. And then the, the observing doctor or doctor uh, said, you know, and this was, to, you know, the, the, the wings of the souls were already, you know, spreading and he was ready to leave. Yeah. So the interpretation of what happened or happens is, of course, culture bounds. Yeah. And we live in a very, very secular culture. Um, so... And thus, I think that's one of the reasons why we currently, and we, I mean, speak of the scientific community, is slightly at loss on how to explain the phenomenon. Because once again, a brain struck by dementia, Levy body, whatever it is, which, which, whatever type of dementia it is, yeah, the neurons don't grow back like that. And not in such a short time, because we talk about spontaneous, you know, somebody's just reoccurring suddenly yeah it's not a slow comeback yeah and such that would almost be like uncooking a boiled egg yeah i mean the tissue is really severely affected with with dementia and nonetheless the person comes back what do you do with it a materialist um philosophy or reductionist background idea whatever is having a hard time let's put it like this yeah Therapy, uh, not therapy, threshold uh, implies going from one place to the other. We've talked about life. What about death? Um, uh, you've written about Vin Victor Sh Frankl and the Shoah. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, the, the event of mass death, uh, 
in, 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 in life itself. Uh, some of the reviews and conversations in the book talk of the evidence for an afterlife. I mean, that's rather sensationalist, rather perhaps even Hollywood sensationalism. <laughs> but did you discover anything, Alexander, about the possibility of an afterlife in this work? Um, um, so there are two answers to this. In the book, I try to, <laughs> to be as careful and I argue a lot for dignity and personhood and so on and so forth. And I think that's very important. Speaking about the Shoah, um, I also remind readers about the so-called euthanasia program when people who were, you know, brain damaged were, you know, discarded because if you're only a machine, you might be a beautiful machine, but if you're really beyond repair, then what do you do? You get disposed, I mean, you, you're thrown away, you know. And, uh, and of course, the other viewpoint is if, if we are persons and if, if there's a sheltered self, I call it like this, yeah, then, then there's hope until the very end. Now, the question is, is there also hope beyond the very end? Um, I, I should say that it is very, very compatible what I find and what I encounter is very compatible. Now, let's leave the evidence and let's talk personally. If you receive 300 letters, and in, this, in the book I also report that we found a parallel to the so-called near-death experience. So that's the very elaborate, complex and ordered systematic experience. People do report and do remember uh, when they are resuscitated after, let's say, cardiac or um, respiratory arrest there. And if you listen to these stories, you know, each single story gets into a table and you have a few markers, you, and that's basically it. Yeah. But behind these, let's see, f let's say four crosses you do on the table, there's a person telling you very, very, in the beginning, incredible things, but then you hear them again and again and again. And then you encounter doctors who tell you that a patient was unconscious and was being resuscitated but what was near death if not almost yeah and and later on told the doctor i know how your socks look like or because and then you you ask how do you know and the patient will tell you because i've been there when you thought i'm un un unconscious on the in the ER, in the emergency room, I was there. I, I listened to you telling he or she is dead or cold blue, whatever. Yeah, and so if you if you hear this often enough, you doubt your doubts. Yeah, because it's almost you wonder how else could you explain this. So what you're saying is, when someone medically dies, they in a sense come to life. Well, funnily enough, I mean, we did a study. It's also reported in the book um, on on cognitive, uh, cognitive um, ability during a near-death experience. And at least two, but enough of one person telling us I was never as awake and as intelligent than when I was dead. <laughs> yeah. And so we looked at, at how, you know, people, what's happening to their minds or to their thinking and to their feeling and also to their seeing during a near-death experience. Are they shallow? Are they half aware? And, and the fact is that they're wide awake, they're very clear. Many of them say, claim, remember that their thinking was much, was much better than during their normal lifetimes. And given the physiological state they are in, and especially given their brain state, yeah, hyperfunction, so lower function, if function at all, yeah, if, you can, if you can measure it at all, at least in the neocortex, yeah, then... Um, yeah, you stand there and wonder, but that's the whole story of it, basically. Is and I, I should, you you showed these reviews. Some of them I know and I expect and I fear them that they're going to be very, you know, yeah, on the afterlife and the existence of the soul yeah, and all that sort of very thing. strong claims will be made, and I will try my best to say it's if I achieve that few basic questions on the soul, perhaps even on the afterlife, yeah. Um, if they are back on the table and we can discuss this in a rational way, you know, all of us, we have our fears, our hopes, and that's totally fine. But if we are aware of our bias, then it's fine. But to bring the questions back on the table, that would be enough if I, if I achieve that. It would be quite a lot, actually. 
Yeah. All right, no, Alexander, no I, hope quick uh, I hope you'll you'll give the money back on the book if there if it's proof <laughs> there's no soul or life after death. <laughs> right? <laughs> Let's see. But you know, to um there are two quick answers which are, I believe too quick to claim that we are merely matter and that's it because it's a presumption it's, it works fine and in science what you do usually try to do is you apply oxygen's razor in other words you try to be you know simplicity has the ring of truth yeah but reductionism in other words to simplify things because then it would be easier to explain is no longer truthful yeah so if we I let, let the readers decide. I mean, uh, the few test readers I had told me that they came back after reading the book fairly convinced that there's some, something about us which is not reducible to matter and therefore may go different ways when it comes to death and dying. Yeah, Because the way of the body we know is decline and decay. Yeah? And what you get on the other side, and that is people becoming more vivid, more lucid, clearer, insightful i mean some of these near-death experiences they come back with beautiful and very very important insights yeah at the moment when evolutionary speaking it's not very adaptive to know so much because you're going to die anyway yeah so if that's it how much sense does it make but you know these are hints and and i understand the, uh, i share the urge to find answers yeah but to find answers we need good questions and we need time to answer them